I'm Benny Bauer. I'm a software architect at Autodesk in Israel. In this talk, I'm going to speak about the serverless architecture and uh, what Python developers can do with it and how, how to use it. You probably saw Autodesk and the sponsors and uh, the booth yesterday. Uh, Autodesk is a software company with large pr portfolio of uh, design, graphics, uh, 3D printing, and many other uh, applications. Um, we are in Israel in Autodesk Tel Aviv, a site of about 130 uh, fun and, and, and uh, great developers. I myself, I belong to the AutoCAD 360 team. So if you haven't heard about AutoCAD, AutoCAD is a, a computer-aided design software. It's the leading one uh, in the industry. Um, mainly used by architects, but not only. And the team in Tel Aviv, our goal is, uh, is, was to take AutoCAD to the cloud to have a mobile and, and web applications. And we already have a, a bunch of them. Um, they were featured on Apple in the last keynote. In case you saw the last keynote with the iPad Pro uh, uh, announcement, we were demoed there. That's the photo from there. Um, and the reason is that we, we uh, always try to take the devices that we have and technology to the edge, and that's why uh, Apple likes to partner with us. But we're going to talk more about the back end and, and the service side, as you, as you uh, can understand. Um, and our back end was uh, written more than uh, seven years ago. We started to write it uh, and use it. And you can understand that over the years, uh, uh, this backend that was built as a monolith gained some weight and gained some uh, technical debt. And about uh, one, eight, one and a half years ago, uh, we decided that uh, we have to rewrite it and we cannot uh, keep uh, using it anymore as it is. Um, and we decided uh, to re-architecture it and, and uh, build it with microservices and uh, we also uh, used this opportunity to check whether the backend that we had, which was written in Java, whether Java is the right uh, uh, runtime for us. And we, after checking a few technologies, a few stacks, we decided that uh, we're going to use Python and Django. And uh, that's the reason uh, I'm here. And uh, so. Uh, I'm a pretty uh, Python newbie, only one and a half years. In order to talk about uh, a serverless architecture, we need some context. And the context is, is the evolution, evolution of the cloud services. We can look at the evolution as, as a evolution of abstract, abstraction layers. So with every generation, adding more abstraction to the developer and handing off the responsibility to someone else. If everything was started with having servers on on-premise, in your company, on your corporate, corporate building, in your own data center. And then uh, we moved to hosting in uh, data centers. So we handed off the dealing, dealing the, with the real estate and the, and the space to someone else. And then when virtualization came, we handed off dealing with the bare metal to someone else, and then we could use VMs. And then came infrastructure as a service with, uh, with Amazon Web Services and later Azure and uh, Google Cloud and many other uh, players, OpenStack. Um, and then we handed off the whole uh, notion of dealing with the, uh, with, with the virtual machines and with the network and, and the storage, we handed off to someone else. Then came platform as a service uh, and the whole notion of, of uh, dealing with the operating system and the middleware was also handed off to someone else. And now we are in the era of, of uh, having a backend as a service, which, uh, so backend as a service uh, means that you don't need to deal with server, with server side at all. Uh, but if you do need to run some code on the server, there's also the serverless uh, architecture in the evolution, which means that you can run code on the server side, but you don't need to deal with the server itself. And that's what we are going to talk about. So a few words on uh, backend as a service. So uh, if you heard about Firebase, Sparse, uh, AWS, uh, Mobile Hub, these are all backends as a service. And, and there are a bunch more. Uh, um, these are all, all services that provide backend as a service. 
uh, which means that they handle with 90% or maybe 80% if we keep with the Pareto uh, uh, of, the, of the things that someone who develops an application needs to deal with. Uh, so uh, authentication, notifications, uh, uh, the data access layer and, and the storage of the data, uh, monitoring and analytics, they, they all come out of the box with these services. The interesting, the interesting uh, thing about, about it and that emphasizes the need and, and how it, how it uh, grows in, this, uh, in the last years was when Facebook uh, that acquired Parse, when they announced at the beginning of the year that they're closing uh, Parse and they're open sourcing it, the, the number of the forks uh, that this project on GitHub, uh, this repository in GitHub got in, in only in a matter of two or three months is incredible. It's over 2,000 forks. So I think it, uh, it can, we will see in the near future that someone else comes with the service uh, instead of Facebook and provides it or, or keeps it open uh, um, for the community. So we got to serverless architecture. And the name serverless is a bit confusing because it doesn't mean that you don't need a server at all. I mean, you need a server because you need to run your backend code on somewhere. Uh, but the thing is that you don't need to deal with it, okay? It's not your responsibility. As we said, it's an abstraction layer that was handed to someone else. And there's a, a nice definition that I bumped into uh, over uh, Twitter saying that service architecture is like saying uh, our architecture does not include service in the same way our architecture does not include electricity. We need electricity, but we don't need to deal with it. Someone else deals with it. So what does it really mean, serverless architecture? So first thing, it means that the compute uh, uh, is fully managed. So provisioning um, and, and patching of the instances or of the our runtime uh, is done automatically for us. Uh, the scalability of the code and, and monitoring, logging, everything is done. Uh, we get everything out of the box and we don't need to do anything for it. Uh, all we need to do is just deploy our code. and. Maybe the most interesting thing about it is that uh, you pay only for the real uh, utilization of your code. So only when the code runs, only then you pay for it. So it's not paying by the hour as it was uh, with uh, AWS and, and all the other services uh, that you pay for the hour for EC2, uh, for example, but you pay per hundreds, hundred of milliseconds. Uh, which is incredible uh, if you think about the cost. It really means that you're fully utilized uh, because you're paying only for what you really use. The first player in this uh, industry was uh, Parse. Again, uh, they had uh, Parse Cloud Code I think, uh, from uh, uh, 2012. Uh, but there were, they were a pretty small uh, player in it, and then, then they weren't fully featured as uh, AWS Lambda. Uh, uh, that was released at the end of uh, 2014 uh, by Amazon. Um, so you can say that AWS Lambda is the major player, and only from the beginning of this year, uh, all the others uh, uh, came following. So uh, Azure have uh, their uh, function, uh, Azure Functions, Google Cloud has has their own uh, uh, Google uh, Cloud Functions and IBM has their uh, open whisk, and there are more uh, players uh, uh, in, in this domain. And, and it's important to mention that uh, the leading standard in, tem in terms of runtime uh, in this industry currently is, uh, is uh, Node.js, okay? Uh, but AWS Lambda and Azure Functions, they, they uh, also support Python, and that's uh, how it relates to us. As a developer, what I need to do is I need to upload my code to AWS uh, Lambda, which means zip my code with all the dependencies and uh, upload it to Lambda. And then uh, the code will, will be triggered as a as, uh, by a by, uh, few uh, different uh, events that could happen. So it can be a REST call uh, that calls the API gateway of AWS, which is tweaked to the specific Lambda. Um, so I can define what are the APIs, the HTTP request, whether it's a uh, post on, or get or any other HTTP verb, uh, and uh, what is the URL and 
uh, what lambda should it call? And uh, another interesting uh, triggers, and that's the power of uh, AWS Lambda, I think, is that it's uh, fully integrated to other services in AWS. So, for example, S3, the storage service, uh, when you upload a file to S3, you can trigger an event that uh, will call Lambda. Uh, Kinesis, the Kafka of, uh, of AWS, uh, every message can, can trigger an event on, uh, on Lambda. Um, DynamoDB, their database as well, every, every change in the database can trigger an event in Lambda, and there are many interesting use cases can be used, and, and we'll see in the next slide. And when we get this code, uh, when we get this uh, event and the code is triggered, uh, it uh, runs on the Lambda, uh, and it scales if needed, so if there are many events, every event will get its Lambda, so the scaling is automatic. And as we mentioned, you pay only for, uh, for the compute time that the Lambda ran. So the first use case, and, and the obvious one, is REST API. So we can build a service, uh, we can deploy it without, without maintaining a server. It's very important to mention that Lambdas are stateless. That's the architecture because they go up, they go down, and uh, you cannot store anything in between, uh, no, persis no persistence in between. Um, so you can think of it, of it as, as uh, the use case of every stateless service uh, that is contained and does something specific can be used in Lambda. Another, if you're in the hype of, of Slack, so it's uh, very suitable for building Slack apps, though not bots because bots are stateful. Uh, so this is something that uh, you need to uh, keep in mind. Event, as I said, so it's useful for file processing, data ingestions, uh, handling incidents by events that are triggered by CloudWatch. Um, and another hype, the Internet of Things, uh, when you usually have many events that need to trigger some specific uh, execution, this is classic for, for a, a serverless. And another popular use case is uh, being able to run scheduled tasks. So it's good for, uh, good for running sanity tests, monitoring, um, even uh, running load testing by spinning many lambdas uh, only for uh, creating this load and uh, scaling them down without paying uh, a lot for it. And uh, obviously any periodical jobs that you have and you don't want to, to handle uh, concurrency or, or how do you uh, get an atomic uh, job to, to work. So this is, a, again, classic use case. But there are also limitations to it. The first one is uh, Lambda. As you can understand, it's not always up. Because it, if it was always up, you, you should have paid for much more than when the code runs. I think it stays like uh, in the memory for five minutes after uh, it was ran. So if you do need something that uh, 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 reacts quickly, uh, but it doesn't happen uh, too often, so you can create a scheduled, uh, scheduled job of Lambda that will call your Lambda um, every five minutes, late, let's say, and just to keep it warm. Um, another uh, thing that co to consider that this convenience of having uh, uh, all the AWS services integrated with AWS Lambda can easily lead to vendor lock-in of staying in, inside Amazon. Um, because it's so easy to tweak everything, so it's something to consider. The, the Lambda itself is just a code that you deploy, so you can deploy this code everywhere. Um, so the Lambda itself is not the lock-in. The lock-in is all the ecosystem around it inside of Amazon. In terms of uh, runtime, so uh, we mentioned it's, it's uh, only Python 2.7, uh, Node.js, and uh, JVM 8. Execution time of, of, of the code that runs in, in Lambda is limited to five minutes, uh, and it's done on purpose. Um, concurrent execution is limited to only 100, 100 uh, Lambdas, but this is, as with other things on Amazon, this is something that you can uh, scale up uh, uh, by uh, con uh, connecting to, uh, getting in contact with uh, the support, and uh, it's something tweakable. And there's also limitations on the payloads uh, uh, that you can deploy to, to Amazon. Um, and uh, 
and uh, the disk size that can be used. Uh, and it's not in all uh, AWS regions. It doesn't work with SSH, obviously, which I think is a good thing, and you're not supposed to connect to the service. This requires a, a mind shift, because not everything is suitable for AWS, uh, for, sorry, for Lambda. Um, and so the code should be small. Uh, it could be, uh, it should be short-lived and uh, obviously stateless. Lambda and API Gateway are nice, but they are not perfect, and there's still some uh, pains to it. So there's a configuration attic, there's a deployment attic, and, the, uh, and uh, it's amazing to see the ecosystem that uh, grew around it. The first thing is a serverless framework that's the leading uh, player in the ecosystem that's an open source uh, with over 8,000 stars already that uh, wraps uh, AWS Lambda and uh, API Gateway and all the configuration needed on Amazon. It manages the deployment. Uh, it has a very nice uh, CLI to, to handle all of this. Um, it's extensible uh, with plugins. Uh, so, for example, if, uh, because it's an open source and they want everyone to, to contribute to it, uh, uh, not everything was supported in the, in the beginning. So let's say supporting uh, VPC was not in the original server, serverless framework. So this was something they introduced via plugin. The community is growing. And, and uh, that's, I think, the interesting uh, point here is that Node.js is definitely the poster boy for uh, serverless. Uh, and uh, uh, the serverless framework was written in Node.js. And Python is uh, kind of a foster boy there. Uh, foster child, and uh, there's a lot of, of place and opportunities for us to to raise the bar there and to contribute. Um, the way, I'm, I'm sorry for running through it, uh, uh, the way uh, you can use it is just uh, four uh, steps. You create a project in the CLI, you create the function that you want to to have uh, and, and define the runtime for it, and then uh, it, you will get a few files created for you. Uh, the handler pi is where you put your implementation or put a code that calls your implementation. And the S function JSON is the configuration file of where you uh, uh, configure all the endpoints or events that will uh, trigger this, uh, this lambda. And then you simply deploy with, uh, with the CLI and what you get back is, uh, is the URL to this endpoint. This is uh, the case of deploying an endpoint and not an event. Brand new, I think it's only two months old, uh, a project that was created by Rick Jones, also open source. Basically, it's a tool for deploying uh, WSGI applications to Lambda. So what it does, it just takes your whole Django or Flask or whatever framework uh, you use and deploys it to, <coughs> deploys it to uh, Lambda. Um, it, creates an intermediate code uh, that uh, uh, translates the way that Lambda request comes in and uh, also translates the response back from, from the framework, from the WSGI, uh, back to Lambda, <clears throat> the way it expects to get it. And basically, basically what happens is that every time uh, your uh, Django or uh, your uh, WSGI application is called, uh, a Lambda spins up. Um, does only the uh, routing to the specific endpoint inside your uh, WSGI application, executes it, and then uh, it shuts it down. Um, so uh, it's, still, it's still too early to say whether it makes sense or not, but uh, that's, uh, that's a nice implementation, and I think it's a good start for uh, 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 leveraging uh, uh, serverless architecture uh, in, in uh, our community. So it's very easy. So this is a demo uh, made by Rick Jones. So it's a, a basic Flask uh, Hello World application. Uh, you have a Zappa settings JSON file that configures what is the entry point and uh, where to put the deployed code on, on, uh, on S3. And then it just deploys it. So it, what it does, it uh, uh, zips the file, zips the, <coughs> the framework. Uh, the project with uh, all the dependencies, uploads it, uh, creates the API gateway routes uh, to to the Lambda, and just and what you get back is a uh, is the endpoint, and then you just call it and uh, it works. I think there are two takeaways that we can that we as a Python community can uh, take from from 
serverless architecture. I really believe that that's the next generation of the evolution of the cloud services, and uh, it's going to really grow uh, in this year and, and later on. The things that I showed you, uh, serverless framework is already being used on production. Zappa, it's uh, brand new, so uh, still not. Things are uh, uh, growing very fast. Uh, the, the real takeaway uh, for us is that uh, I think our community have um, many, many interesting uh, places and opportunities to contribute. Um, it's out there on, uh, on uh, GitHub, and there are uh, uh, references uh, on my slides uh, that you can uh, go and check later, uh, and you're, uh, uh, you can talk to me as well. And the question was whether uh, AutoCAD for 60 our products in Autodesk depend on Amazon. So yeah, we use uh, AWS. Uh, we still uh, don't leverage AW, uh, Lambda too much. We, have, uh, we do it for some, let's say, uh, back office handling, uh, not something that users are facing yet. Uh, but we're uh, really uh, uh, intrigued by it, and we're looking at it. Uh, the question was whether there's a planned support for uh, Python 3 on the serverless framework. Um, I don't think it, there is right now. Uh, it's all being uh, discussed in, in the GitHub issues of the, of the repository, and, and it's, uh, there's also a Gitter uh, uh, team, uh, Gitter uh, channel for, for uh, Slack. So. It's very dynamic, and I think if uh, the Python community will show more interest in it, then uh, I think uh, uh, it will come. But as I said, the main actor there is, uh, is Node.js, definitely Node.js. Uh, so the question was, what are the trade-offs in terms of performance and, and expense and cost of uh, using uh, Lambdas? Lambda is supposed to be uh, much more cost-effective. Uh, in terms of performance, if you not keep it warm, then uh, the performance will be uh, bad uh, in terms of spinning up the Lambda. Uh, if you, I guess that there's a certain uh, uh, threshold that of, of spinning Lambdas, then uh, that you will better have a reserved instance, uh, EC2 reserved instance, than running Lambdas. Um, and again, it's, it's still pretty uh, new. Uh, so, and there were benchmarks and there are numbers about it, but uh, I, I cannot say still from our experience what is better. We, we didn't utilize it enough to say that. Yes.